let's see if we can get the other side, the other perspective now from Manuel Hassassian, the former head of the Palestinian diplomatic mission to the United Kingdom. He joins me this morning from Copenhagen. Uh, thank you so much for making the time for us this morning. I do want to start off by putting to you directly um, a, a claim made there by Daniel Taub that, that perhaps the Palestinian Authority has missed a trick by not getting a firm hand on Hamas, by not controlling uh, the Palestinian territory uh, in a way that perhaps it should. Has the Palestinian Authority been too weak on Hamas? The question is not being too weak or strong. What happened is that Hamas was created actually by the consent of the Israelis to concoct an alternative leadership to the PLO. And that took place during the first Intifada where Hamas started, you know, developing its military power, its uh, political impact. It's getting, uh, you know, control of civil society to a certain extent. And unfortunately, in the year 2008, we had, you know, the coup d'etat which made Hamas took over Gaza. And since then, the Palestinian Authority does not have any control over Hamas. And, uh, of course, Hamas acts as a military wing, and we cannot control them. We have, as PLO, uh, succumbed to the fact that the uh, politique real uh, imposed on us to have peace with the Israelis. So we went ahead with political accommodation. And for the last 30 years, we have been talking about two-state solution, and that two-state solution, unfortunately, has been uh, now obliterated by the fact of the Israelis building settlements and moving settlers. Today we have 750,000 settlers in the West Bank. And the ongoing, you know, occupation, you know, uh, of the daily lives of the Palestinians, not making it easy by killing them, extrajudicial building settlements and what have you, had made it worse. For the last 13 years, there had been a total stalemate in the peace process since the advent of Netanyahu. Nothing happened on the ground, and we still, you know, hope for a two-state solution. A two-state solution cannot really be, in fact, implemented if we have non-geographic contiguity uh, in the West Bank, where, you know, if you look at the West Bank, it's like a Swiss cheese map, where it is like archipelago islands with no geographic contiguity, how on earth can we have our, you know, sovereign state with East Jerusalem and let alone Gaza, which has its own unique circumstances, to have an independent state within the concept of the Oslo Agreement. So things are getting more difficult with mm -hmm. the latest onslaught now on Gaza. I don't think there is a, a, a light at the end of the tunnel so far. Of course, what Daniel Taub was saying there was that Israel's uh, withdrawing from the West Bank in the mid 2000s is what made, uh, or, or at least created, um, from Gaza I mean, um, is what uh, created the conditions whereby Hamas could come about. And, and, and to that extent, a similar withdrawal from the West Bank would risk a similar situation occurring on the other side of the country. Uh, does he have a point? Well, actually, when they withdrew from Gaza, it was a unilateral pullout. It was not negotiated by the Palestinian Authority in order to know exactly how to deal with it and how to connect that to the West Bank. It was unilateral. And uh, once they moved, what they created is a besieged people. You know, it's, uh, everybody, you know, I started to talking about 13 years ago about open air concentration camp in Gaza. No, I mean, the, the, the connection between Gaza and the West Bank was totally curtailed by the Israelis. So there was no connection first. And second, when the coup d'etat took place, the Palestinian Authority, as an authority, was not there anymore. Now we're not talking about factions being there, Fatah and what have you, but we're talking about authority. Hmm. So Hamas is took it, is over. It, is it right to refer to, uh, given the particular history of the Jewish people, is it right to refer to Gaza as a quote unquote concentration camp? Isn't that a, a bit of a crass comparison, given that one of the borders of Gaza is with Egypt, a, a, an Arab country, 
which uh, also refuses to open the border because it doesn't want to let in many, many uh, Gazan refugees. Well, actually, uh, Egypt has the right not to accept refugees. That's, they are sovereign and they made their decisions. And uh, they believe that, you know, opening the borders, meaning another displacement of the Palestinians, going into Sinai, another extra burden for them. And they don't want their uh, 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 a sense of guilt of decimation the entire Palestinian people through another Nakba, which has been taking place since 1948. So the Egyptians, mm -hmm. out of political position, they don't want to be engaged in such a venture where eventually it will be attacked by the Arab world, by the Palestinians, by everybody. By opening the borders, it means that you are consenting to the fact of Israel to forcefully diasporize one million Palestinians, if not two, to a country, to the desert, where they don't belong. They belong to Gaza. It's their country. And they have been totally besieged by the Israelis since, nine, since 16 years. And that's why when we talk about open air concentration camp, where is the event for the Gazans to move? They cannot move to Egypt and they cannot go to Israel. And, and how, how do you want the 2.2 million people to survive such a besiegement mm -hmm. for 16 years? So this created a certain kind of yeah. frustration. This created a certain kind of extremism about, uh, you know, having like Hamas, supporting Hamas, but the entire Palestinians in Gaza are not supporting mm. Hamas. So, some some so people might raise an eyebrow. Collective punishment on 2.2 million people because you have one portion, a militia that is controlling, you know, mm. Gaza, in mm. order to collectively punish 2.2 million. And this so, is what Israel mm. is doing. So, so some people might raise an eyebrow as to why all the criticism is with Israel for not opening its, its border with Gaza. And, and almost no criticism at, at all is placed on Egypt for precisely the same policy. Um, I, I, I do want to move on to something that is affecting the United Kingdom, though, because we have seen many, many protests in recent days, large marches. Uh, and one of the chants that has been made by pro-Palestinian protesters on these protests is from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. A chant that seems to imply that these protesters want to wipe Israel off the face of the map. Is that an appropriate chant to be making? Well, let, you, let me tell you this. I was 13 years ambassador to the UK and I have participated in half a million protesters, let me tell you, and you have to be very blunt about this. Out of 300,000, 299,000 are Pakistani Muslims, Indian Muslims, Bengali Muslims, and what have you. So don't try to stigmatize from river to the sea Palestinians. Palestinians have accepted, you know, uh, a, a mini state on the borders of 1967, and that is our official position. And our people have accepted that in the West Bank and Gaza. So we cannot try to say that we, the PLO or what have you, want Palestine from the river to the sea. And that's mm. my simple answer to you. Mm. And just quickly, before we finish this interview, um, I, I want to give you an opportunity uh, to, of course, condemn the horrific attacks that we saw from uh, Hamas. The, uh, and would you, perhaps, unlike some broadcasters in the United Kingdom, declare these as terrorist attacks? Can I ask you a question? Because you asked me a question. You didn't ask Ambassador Tao to condemn what state terrorism is inflicting today on Gaza. And don't compare the occupied with the, occup with the occupation, uh, with the occupied, and don't try to put us, you know, all in a frame that we are terrorists as Palestinians. There is a difference between mm. the Palestinian people who want peace and security, mm. and there is a difference between the Palestinian Authority, which is the legitimate, legitimate representative of mm. the Palestinian people, who believe in a two-state solution, who have condemned violence all along.
The question is, can Israel stop state terrorism on equal basis? Mm. That's, now, that's of course, it. of course, I did question the former Israeli ambassador at length in terms of what would be a proportionate response and whether it was right or not to be cutting off water or indeed electricity. I asked him detailed questions there. I know you haven't responded to the question in terms of whether or not this should be condemned as a terrorist attack, the actions of Hamas two weeks ago. Violence breeds violence. And the situation in Gaza was on a powder keg. And what happened basically is a retaliation on the daily atrocities that the Israelis with the settlers are committing against our innocent civilians in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, in Gaza and what have you. So you want me to condemn violence while state terrorism, 56 of occupation, killing people, extrajudicial. Now you woke up to see that the other side is terrorist and violent and not Israel, which is an occupying power. I don't think this is a fair question. OK, you don't think it's a fair question. That's clear enough. Manuel Hassassian, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your perspective as well this morning. For